startup nation. How technological entrepreneurship saves economies with limited natural resources. Dan Shechtman, Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. On November the 9th, 1989, I was at home and listening to the news on the radio. And I remember saying to myself, wow, this is an end to an era and the beginning of a new one. Let us look at the world we live in today. It's a very interesting world. On the one hand, we live in a world of peace. There is not a single war across boundaries today, as of 3 o'clock this afternoon. And yet, there are many internal wars in the world. These are wars within countries. And Syria is an extreme example, but there are many such wars, internal conflicts between tribes, between religions, within countries in the Middle East, in Africa, and elsewhere. Let us look at the world population today. There was a fear, especially famous is the Malthus theory, that the world population will grow in such a rate to such numbers that there will not be enough food for everybody. Well, Malthus did not know that you are going to have an agricultural revolution. There will be more food than expected. And Malthus could not know that the world population grows in a slower and slower pace, so much so that it is expected that in the year 2050, the world population will not grow anymore. And there will be food for everybody. This is wonderful news, right? But problem is that the world population growth decline is not evenly distributed across the globe. In countries in Europe, the average number of children per woman is too low. One and a half child per woman, depending on the countries. In the Far East, the situation is even worse. There are close to one child per woman in countries in the Far East. Now think about it, one child per woman means that every generation will be half of the present generation. People will disappear from some countries. Well, not actually, because if uh, Taiwan uh, will shrink, China will fill in. But, but certain cultures will just, just disappear. This is one side of the globe. If you go to Africa and look at the number of children per woman, there are countries in which the numbers are unbelievable. In Niger, it is more than seven children per woman on the average. Mali, 6.3 children per woman. Many countries in Central Africa have very many, many children. Now, if you look at what are the countries that have internal conflicts? If you look at what are the countries that have large population growth, there's one thing in common to all of them. They are poor countries. And one solution to overcoming this problem of poverty is technological entrepreneurship. And this is the subject I want to talk to you about. So what is technological entrepreneurship? It's an establishment of a new technology venture. You have to establish it, it has to be new, it has to be technology, and it is venture. It means that you may fail. In fact, most startups fail. But that's okay. Many countries in their culture will not open new startups because of fear of failure. It is true in many countries in Europe. It is by far true in the Far East. Because if you fail, it's a shame on you. It's a shame on your family. It's a shame on your city. It's a shame on the emperor, God forbid. We don't want that. We have to teach them that failure is okay. Start again. By now, you are an experienced entrepreneur. I trust you. You will not make the same mistake again. Okay. What does it take to create a society which is entrepreneurial? Number one, it takes good education for all. 
good education for all. Not only for the people in the cities, the people in the villages. Now, these are, these are the villages or the periphery. These are the people that have many children. They will work when you retire. So you want them to be well educated. That's not enough, of course. We also need to have very good higher education. You have to produce engineers and scientists and MDs and physicists and, and so on. This is number two. Number three, government policy. Governments can have a very important effect on the success of startups. And governments can do many things for the success. I'm against too much intervention of government with business, but to support business, to support startups, they can do that, and government should. Free market economy is another condition for success of a startup. And number five, and very important, no corruption. No corruption. If you have corruption in a, in a, in a country, no chance for startups to succeed. But all this may not be enough. So let's suppose that you have good education, you have science education, and you have no corruption, you have good government policy, this may not be enough. Also needed is the fostering and knowledge of entrepreneurial information and entrepreneurial spirit. These are two things, knowledge and spirit. Knowledge means how can you open a startup? What do I do? Spirit means that everybody talks about it. It's the talk of the town. Young people talk about ideas. Young people exchange ideas. Young people say, wow, I would like to open a startup, and I have an idea, and now I look for a couple of friends to help me do that. This is the spirit of entrepreneurship. And you have, we have to foster both of them. Can we teach entrepreneurship? Yes, we can, and we should. We can teach anything. Anything can be taught. And we should do that. We should teach it. Where should we teach it? In high schools. We do it in Israel. We have projects for high school students to open a startup, a real one. Register a company, make a product, try to sell the product, try to interest people to support you, and so on. High school. Of course, universities, especially the engineers, the scientists, the MDs, the computer experts, these are the people that open startups. Now, in addition to that, vocational school. This is true in Germany, Netherlands, Austria. You have a system in which people learn how to work with their hands. They can be entrepreneurs too. These are very gifted children. They can do, I'm sorry, these are very gifted people. They can do things, they can make things in their hands. If you go to Ivy League universities in the world and you ask them, do you teach entrepreneurship? They say, but of course we are the best. But where do they teach entrepreneurship? They teach it in MBA programs. They teach how to manage startups. But the, the students are lawyers and accountants. These are not the people that open startups. So they teach how to manage the startup. But who will open the startups? We need to teach them, people, the engineers, the scientists, the MDs, and so on, how to open startups. OK. Who should teach? Role models. Role models are wonderful. People that every young man and woman wants to follow and say, I would like to be like him, or I would like to be like her. And these are the people to follow. How can you have these people meet? The young people who are capable of opening a startup, and you want to motivate them, and you want to make them really think that it's a wonderful idea. How do you make them meet these role models? And this is. Um, a class that I have been teaching at the Technion for 27 years now. In 20, 27 years ago, we did not have the terminology. We didn't have a word for startup in Hebrew. And, and the reason I taught this class, it, it takes me back to my history. When I was a student, I studied mechanical engineering. And um, when I studied mechanical engineering, the Technion spirit, Technion is my university, in Haifa, the spirit was, the technical told us, you will be so good that when you graduate, everybody will want to hire you. You will be employable. And I said to myself, okay, that's a good idea, but what if I want to open my own company? 
My university did not teach anything about it. In 1986, many years later, I became a full professor, and, uh, <laughs> and then I decided here is the time to do what I wanted, what I wanted to study, I want to teach my students. And I started a class at the Technion to teach technological entrepreneurship. How does this class work? And it worked the same way for 27 years because I did a lot of thinking and it worked very well. Number one, it is a very large class, many hundreds of students in my class. Why so? Because I want everybody to be exposed. And those that will be infected by the bug of entrepreneurship, wonderful. Number one. Number two, all the speakers in my class are invited speakers. I invite people. These are role models and professionals. I will explain. There are three groups of people that come to talk in my class. Group number one are the successful entrepreneurs of the country that everybody knows about them. What's common to all of them is they all started bootstrapping. That means with nothing. They were poor people, but gifted, talented, and ambitious. And they, made, they started startups that now worth billions of dollars. This is group number one. Group number two are young people, men and women, who opened a startup recently in the last few years. They struggle now to make their company a success and they share with the student their experience and they give good advices and the students can identify with them because they're almost the same age. And many of the speakers in my class took my class 10, 20 years ago. So they come again now to speak to my students. Group number three are the professionals. So who are the professionals? I bring a lawyer to tell the students what is a limited company and why you should open one and not take the financial burden on your narrow shoulders. Have a barrier between you and the customer. I bring the patent officer of the country to talk about what is a patent, what kind of protection it gives you, what kind of protection it does not give you, where do you register, is it provisional in the United States or in this it in your country, maybe you want your product to go to the Far East, how do you do that? I bring somebody who talk about market survey. Market survey means that you have to know your market very well. And before you even start, you want to know where you are going. You need to know who are the competitors. You need to know what are the products that compete with you. You need to know the trends of the trade. And you want to follow up after the first investigation, follow up every day what's happening in your market. And I bring somebody to talk about marketing, okay? So now you have a product. How do you market this product? Now, this is that's the baseline of, of, my, um, of my class. Final results. Over the last 27 years, I had about 10,000 engineers and, and scientists that took my class. 10,000 engineers and scientists for a small country like Israel is a very large number. And they, ha they walk about with a bug of entrepreneurship in their mind. And when you have a large number, you create a spirit of entrepreneurship. People talk about it. You can see it on their campus. Young people talk about entrepreneurship. They talk about an idea. They talk about their will and wishes to come entrepreneurs um, sometime in their future. So this is the spirit and the knowledge, of course, comes in my class. I think that technological entrepreneurship is one solution to problems of many poor countries. Let me tell you something. There is money in Africa now <coughs> that comes from China. China buys minerals in Africa. There is money in Africa. If they invest in education, if they invest in higher education, if they invest in teaching entrepreneurship, we have hope. We have hope to these poor countries that will flourish, not, not invest in buildings and, and, and infrastructure, invest in the human mind. The most important resource of any country is the human mind. Invest in that. I have four seconds to go. Thank you very much.